All right. Hello, hello. How's everyone doing? Good. Okay, so Capturing Christianity is the one, the, the ministry that is putting on this event tonight. And uh, what we like to do with these events is keep it really relaxed and really chill. Okay, so this is going to be a real homey sort of environment. We want everyone to, to be friends tonight. And I think, hopefully, that's what you're going to see, even with a debate like this on whether or not God exists between a Christian and an atheist, hopefully you're going to get some good vibes tonight, in addition to some really heavy philosophy. This is going to be very, very fun. Uh, it's going to be challenging, but let me just introduce the two debaters tonight. So we have Eric Hernandez over here. <laughs> I don't know if y'all could hear that on the stream, but uh, Eric was getting booed by his friends. <laughs> is that, yeah, is that, I was gonna say, is that, is, do you call them friends if they're booing you on your debate? So, <laughs> so Eric, he's a dynamic evangelist and apologist with a heart for proclaiming the gospel and defending the faith on theological and philosophical grounds. He's a licensed minister, a certified formation therapist, and the Apologetics Lead and Millennial Specialist for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. He holds an associate degree in social science, a bachelor's degree in theology, and a certificate in apologetics from Biola University. So let's all welcome Eric one more time. And then the uh, baby eater on this side, Justin. <laughs> He is our, uh, our atheist interlocutor tonight. Now, Justin, Justin is actually, he and I are very good friends. Let me, let me tell a little bit of a uh, story about Justin. So a lot of people are not going to know who Justin is. If you're into apologetics or you're into philosophy, there's this whole world that exists on YouTube just for apologetics. That's kind of where Capturing Christianity lives is in that space. And Justin was actually really big in this space several years ago. And everyone who knew who Justin was loved him for all sorts of reasons. But then he decided to, to be really selfish and focus on himself and focus on other things other than philosophy and apologetics. So he took a break for several years, but now he's back. And I am so excited to welcome him back to the world of philosophy and apologetics and everything. It's so great. So we are... We are super happy, super happy to have Justin here. So a little bit about him. He's a former co-host of the Reasonable Doubts podcast, as well as the founder and recently returning host of Real Atheology, a podcast that explores philosophy of religion from a non-theistic perspective. So uh, again, I mean, I, I can't say enough about Justin. I think throughout the night, you'll understand why I'm sort of gushing over him. He's awesome. Justin is, just, he's great. I didn't say that many nice things about you, did I? <laughs> oh well, um, we're, we're friends, we're friends. Okay, so a, a little about the, the structure of, of tonight's debate. So this is actually going to be a formal debate. Um, sorry to, to bum some of you out. This is, we are gonna have some open dialogue, but here's the way that tonight's going to run. So we're gonna have 15 minute opening statements from each debater, followed by 10 minute rebuttals, then 30 minutes of moderated dialogue, followed by 30 minutes of q and I'll give you more instructions on how to do the Q&A. Uh, this building is set up. There's not a whole lot of space, so we've got to run that uh, in a very specific way. I'll give you more instructions on that later. And then at the very end, we'll do five-minute closings, and that's going to be it. But again, it's going to be very uh, a friendly environment, and this is going to be a, a really, really good night. So with that, uh, I'm actually, so I'll be sitting here for the moderated dialogue, but for the openings and rebuttals, I'm going to be sitting over here to make sure I'm not in the way of uh, the screen and all the slides and everything. I'm taking a seat over here. Let's welcome Eric as he gives his opening statement. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. I'd especially like to thank Cameron Bertuzzi and Capturing Christianity, the Lanier Theological Library for hosting this debate, and of course my debate opponent Justin Schieber, and thank you Justin for giving me the home field advantage. Um, given that this debate is between Justin and me, there are only two live options on the table for answering tonight's question. Atheism and theism. 
If we define atheism as a position that God does not exist and theism as a position that God does exist, then by eliminating one of these options, we are ultimately left with the only option that will answer tonight's question. With this in mind, Justin and I have agreed to present three arguments in favor of our position. And my three will be, one, the existence of evil, two, the existence of knowledge and rationality, and three, the existence of the soul. And I will argue that the existence of these three are best supported by theism over atheism by arguing that if atheism were true, then we would not expect these three things to exist. Thus, if these three things do exist, then atheism is false. And if atheism is false, then theism is true and God does exist. With this in mind, consider my first argument. Premise one, if atheism is true, then evil would not exist. Two, evil exists, therefore atheism is false. Now, it's been said that the existence of evil is one of the strongest arguments against the existence of God. However, in order for the atheist to assume evil exists, he must first assume two things. One, that an objective moral standard exists, and two, that there is teleology to life in the natural world. However, if neither of these assumptions can be accounted for on an atheistic worldview, then the existence of evil becomes an argument not against God, but against atheism. Regarding the first assumption, we can, when we observe the features of objective morality, we, it, is, it becomes clear that the reason for its existence must be grounded in a source that is rational and sentient, necessary, eternal, personal, and transcendent, namely God. Hence, without God, there can be no objective moral standard. Now, much like a lie is a deviation of truth, so too evil is a deviation from an objective moral standard. Therefore, if evil exists, then it is a deviation from an objective moral standard, and this objective moral standard can only be grounded in God. Putting the same point in reverse, it, evil requires an objective moral standard to exist, and an objective moral standard requires that God must exist. Hence, if God does not exist, then an objective moral standard does not exist, and if an objective moral standard does not exist, then evil cannot exist either. However, if evil does exist, then as concluded in my argument, atheism is false and God must exist. Two, the second assumption, uh, the second prerequisite for the existence of evil that the atheist must assume is the existence of teleology to life for the natural world. Briefly, teleology is a notion of a final cause, an objective goal or purpose to the way things are. It is that for the sake of which something is brought about. It is the reason for which, i.e. the objective goal or purpose to something. Now, it's important to, to note that if there is no God, there can be no final causes to life in the natural world. There can only be efficient causes. In other words, if there's no God, then we can't say that we are evolving for the sake of something, because on atheism, our existence cannot be explained or derived from an objective final cause or teleological standard as if we exist for some objective goal or purpose, but rather can and must be explained purely in terms of efficient causes and not final causes. Hence, if there is no God, then there is no teleology to life in the natural world by default. Moreover, teleology implies that there is a way things ought to be, which entails the notions of proper function and are flourishing. To illustrate, consider how the existence of a bad phone presupposes the existence of teleology. First, a bad phone implies that there is a dysfunction and a deviation from a proper function, meaning that there is something my phone ought to do, but it is not, which entails that there is an objective goal and purpose and final cause for which my phone was made. But now two further implications follow from the existence of teleology, namely, that there is a design plan for which all of these notions of teleology must be in alignment with, which of course would imply that there must be a designer. And with respect to the phone, this would be something like Android or Apple. Now, let's apply this to life in the natural world and consider an objection from the ex to the existence of God on the basis of a child being born with a fatal disease. A disease, by definition, is a disorder of structure or function. Hence, a disease implies dysfunction, which would imply a deviation from the existence of a proper function, which would imply that there is an ought to how the body should be acting, which is what gives rise to the proper function, and would imply an objective goal and an objective purpose to life, which is where the goal stems from, which would imply a final cause, all of which would imply teleology to life in the natural world. But again, if this is the case, 
then it infers some type of design plan, which would infer a designer, and hence, something like God. So, we can simplify this by saying that if a disease is evil, which implies dysfunction, and such things imply teleology, then God must exist as a foundation and reason for which there can be teleology to life in the first place. But, if there is no God, then there can be no teleology, and thus, evil cannot exist in this way. Hence, both of these two prerequisite assumptions for the existence of evil provide evidence for my first argument that if evil exists, then atheism is false, and if atheism is false, then as I, as I said in my opening, theism is true and God must exist. Setting the existence of evil aside, note that in order to even answer tonight's debate question, we must assume that knowledge and rationality exist. Hence, my second argument. Premise one, if atheism is true, the knowledge and rationality would not exist. Two, some atheists, such as Justin, have used their knowledge and rationality to become atheists. Therefore, knowledge and rationality exist, and therefore, atheism is false. This would mean that to even answer tonight's question, God must exist. By way of preliminary remarks, knowledge is at minimum a justified or warranted true belief. Think of this like ingredients in a cake. If you're missing one ingredient, you can't have knowledge. To illustrate, Suppose you wake up from a nap and you see that the microwave reads 12 o'clock, and on that basis, you form the belief that it is 12 o'clock. But then you feel that it's hot in your house, there's water under the fridge, and you notice that the microwave is actually blinking 12 o'clock, and thus, you conclude that the power must have gone out. Now, the question is, is it 12 o'clock? Well, you don't know. As they say, a broken clock is still right twice a day. But the point here is that if your belief that it is 12 o'clock is based solely on the reading of the microwave, and given that the power has gone out, then you now have what's called an undercutting defeater for trusting in the reliability of the microwave, and this would equally remove all rational justification for trusting in the validity and truth of any belief that is based on the reading of the microwave. In the same way, if there is no God, then a similar problem arises on atheism with respect to knowledge and rationality for at least two reasons, all of which have to do with the reliability of our cognitive faculties and for the sake of simplicity, we can just say the brain. First, if there is no God, then our brains were not designed to obtain truth, and this is obvious given that on atheism there is no designer. And second, if there is no God, then our cognitive faculties given natural selection, at best, would only aim at survival value and not truth value. In other words, if our beliefs and behaviors play any role in this evolutionary process, the natural selection is going to select for beliefs that produce adaptive behavior and grant survival value. Consequently, this would mean that natural selection wouldn't care whether or not your beliefs are true, but merely that your beliefs help you to adapt and survive. To give an example of this, suppose a car is coming towards me and I form the belief that in order to survive, I must jump out of the way. So, I do that and natural selection sees that these beliefs produce adaptive behavior and says, check, Let's go ahead and pass those on, give that these beliefs produced and granted survival value. But note that if a false set of beliefs could equally work and grant survival value, then your beliefs don't have to be true for them to be passed on given natural selection. To illustrate, take the same scenario, but imagine a different set of beliefs. A car is coming towards me, but I have the belief that I'm Superman, and if the car hits me, I won't die. However, because I want to protect my identity as Clark Kent, and don't want people to know I'm Superman, so, in order to do that, I jump out of the way to appear human and conceal my identity. Which means that these false set of beliefs could still produce the same type of uh, adaptive behavior and survival value, and again, natural selection wouldn't care if your beliefs are true. Now, I say that to say, just as there is an undercutting defeater for trusting in the reliability of the microwave, which would further remove all rational justification for the validity and truth of any belief that is based on the reading of the microwave, then in the same way, if there is no God, then you now have an undercutting defeater for trusting in the rational reliability of your brain, which further removes all rational justification for trusting in the validity and truth of any belief your brain produces. And thus, if atheism is true, and Justin's brain has produced in him the belief that there is no God, then it becomes a belief that is undercut by this type of defeater, and thus, he shouldn't trust or believe it. Moreover, if knowledge is at minimum a justified true belief, and if given naturalism, you now have an undercutting defeater for any belief your brain produces, 
then rational justification for trusting in the truth of your beliefs becomes unjustified, and without these ingredients, knowledge becomes impossible. Hence, my argument that if atheists like Justin have used their knowledge and rationality to become atheists, then knowledge and rationality exist, and therefore, atheism is false. And once again, if atheism is false, then theism is true, and God does exist. <clears throat> now, even if Justin could overcome this problem, which I don't think is possible, Answering tonight's question assumes the existence of consciousness and implicitly libertarian free will. Hence, my final argument from the existence of the soul. Premise one, if atheism is true, then given naturalism, souls, i.e. immaterial substances and properties, would not exist. If souls do not exist, then consciousness and free will would not exist. In support of premise one, as philosopher J.P. Morley argues in his book, consciousness and the existence of God, he says, the naturalist epistemology and grand story constrain the naturalist ontology and justify strong naturalism and a rejection of emergent entities. Many naturalists who keep a steady eye on broader epistemological and metaphysical issues reach the same conclusion. And he points out how for the agnostic philosopher Frank Jackson, he states that if naturalism is to have superior explanatory power, then this entails strong naturalism. Summarizing the sentiment, atheist philosopher of mind Paul Churchland remarks, the important point about the standard evolutionary story is that the human species and all of its features are wholly the physical outcome of a purely physical process. If this is a correct account of our origins, he continues, then there seems neither need nor room to fit any non-physical substances or properties into our theoretical accounts of ourselves. We are creatures of matter, and we should learn to live with that fact. Regarding premise two, consciousness and free will ontologically require a soul in order to exist or be possible. Beginning with the nature of consciousness, I submit to you that it must be immaterial, given that its existence cannot be identical nor reducible to the physical. And this is easily demonstrated via Leibniz's law of identity. For example, my thoughts can be true or false, but no region of my brain is true or false. My brain can weigh three pounds, but the thought of this debate doesn't weigh three pounds. A taste of banana can measure seven inches, uh, excuse me, a state of my brain can measure seven inches long, but the smell of a rose or the taste of a banana can't be seven inches long. Hence, if consciousness exists, it cannot be identical nor reducible to the physical. Concerning free will, and more specifically libertarian free will, this can be defined as being the first mover of one's will or actions. That is to say, you are not caused to act or will by something prior or external to yourself. <clears throat> However, if naturalism is true, then as secular philosopher Jaguan Kim argues, the causal closure of the physical must be true. According to this law, no physical event has a non-physical cause. Consequently, this would mean that on atheism, every thought, decision, belief, and behavior was causally determined by physical events external to and beyond one's control. Put differently, this would mean that Justin's very decision to become an atheist was not the result of rigorous research and freely following the evidence where it led and freely coming to his own conclusion, but rather it was something he was causally determined to believe by prior non-rational factors beyond his control and he could not have believed otherwise. As with the previous argument, this presents an undercutting defeater for knowledge, rationality, and now, without the existence of the soul, no consciousness, no free will, and consequently, no foundation for moral responsibility or intellectual integrity for any belief he holds to. Thus, if Justin made a conscious free decision to become an atheist, then consciousness and free will exist, therefore, souls exist, therefore, atheism is false. And as before, once again, if atheism is false, then theism is true and God does exist. Now, in conclusion, note the irony of my entire case for answering tonight's question. And just in case this implicit point hasn't been made clear, allow me to make it explicit. Suppose Justin uses an argument from the existence of evil against the existence of God, and you, the audience member, agree with him. And then, using your knowledge and rationality to freely follow the evidence that he presents, find yourself with the conscious belief that Justin is correct, then it would follow that evil, knowledge and rationality, consciousness, and free will, which ontologically require a soul to ground them, must exist, and thus, given my arguments, it would follow that atheism is false and God does exist. 
So ironically, even if you're convinced that Justin has won this debate by the end of the night, then it would only mean that atheism is false, theism is true, and therefore God must exist. Thank you. All right, good evening. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, participating in tonight's debate. I consider it a real privilege to be having this dialogue with my new friend Eric. Um, the question being, does God exist? I hold that God probably does not exist. Um, appropriately then, I've been asked to share with you some reasons uh, for this, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Like many of my fellow atheists, I am also a naturalist. A uh, quick and dirty kind of definition of this is going to be um, one I like is by philosopher Luke Roloff. So according to this definition, naturalism is the view, oh, there we go, uh, naturalism is the view uh, that the world contains a single basic type of stuff whose behavior um, is governed by a single set of simple general laws and that those laws are those revealed by science. Before diving into the evidence, I want to say a little bit about theory comparison. So, all else being equal, there's good reason to prefer the worldview or theory that contains the fewer kinds of entities. Both naturalism and theism are committed to the basic type of stuff, as well as the laws that relate them. However, theism is committed to additional kinds or categories of basic agents, novel forms of causation, and basic powers. Now, if that's right, uh, one thing that naturalism has in its favor, at least at this stage, is its qualitative simplicity. And now for my evidence for naturalism. Evolutionary evil is experienced by sentient beings who are not moral agents. In River Out of Eden, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins writes, the total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. During the minute it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. Others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst, and disease. It must be so. If there ever is a time of plenty, this very fact will automatically lead to an increase in the population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. For millions upon millions of years then, this predation, parasitism, and privation have been the rule rather than the exception. This is the ultimate Hunger Games scenario. My argument starts with the fact that there are sentient beings and that some of them are not moral agents and asks which, which theory best explains the fact that the non-moral agent variety has experienced these evolutionary evils as deeply and for as long as they in fact have. Now, if naturalism is true, any life that exists will be biologically embodied. By that I mean that they will be relatively fragile, metabolic, organic systems dependent upon their environment. As populations become isolated, we'd expect differing evolutionary strategies to develop. Notably on naturalism, there's not going to be any moral constraints on the strategies that they might develop. However, if theism is true, the very concept, the very concept of life is going to be much more broad. After all, omnipotence is not limited to crafting biological forms of life. Any conceivable object, natural or supernatural, can be created and imbued with mentality and basic powers to act and to interact with each other and with the environment. 
God was not limited to the orchestration of these mortal metabolisms that endlessly struggle for finite resources, nor was it a necessary truth that the resources over which they struggle include, for some designs, the very flesh of others. There was always a vegetarian option, and the fact that the Creator did not avail itself of that option surely counts against its goodness. Now, if God exists, there appears to be a deep coincidence here. God just so happened to create life that was, one, biologically embodied, and two, by way of an apparently morally blind evolutionary process. These both had to be the case if naturalism is true, but of course, neither had to be the case if theism is true. What's more, because God is perfectly compassionate and is aware of the intrinsic badness of animal suffering, theists need to assert theodicies wherein God's permitting the suffering and death of non-human agents for millions of years is morally good, all things considered. Naturalism has no need for such elaborations, for these reasons, evolutionary evils visited upon sentient beings who are not moral agents are more probable on naturalism than on theism. This fact thereby constitutes evidence favoring naturalism over theism. The second piece of evidence is the near universal hostility to the, of, of the universe to the survival of sentient beings who are moral agents. Astronomer Phil Plate writes, the universe is an incredibly hostile place for life. It cares not at all if we live or if we die. If a human were magically transported to any random spot in the cosmos, within seconds he would die 99.9999 I will lose count of those nines percent of the time. If naturalism is true, the fact that moral agents exist entails that some physical location within the universe is life permitting. But given that there are many, many more ways uh, within, sorry, given that there are many more ways uh, for a given location to be incompatible with the survival of fragic, organic, highly environmentally dependent life forms than for it to be permitting of such life forms, we'd expect any permitting portion to be the extreme exception. And that's exactly what we see. The vast majority of the universe is hostile to such fragility. Now, if theism is true, this is somewhat surprising. Right, so for example, the inference I just outlined uh, regarding the expectation of near universal hostility, recall that it was based on a premise of cosmic indifference to value, right, this, on naturalism. However, this fact renders, on, on theism, this fact renders uh, the inference unavailable to the theist. Moreover, near universal hostility limits the highest form of physically instantiable value in the world or in any world uh, in where it holds true. Now that value being the value of biologically embodied moral agency, the highest form of value we know to exist in the universe. The larger the portion of the physical world that is biological, that is, um, biological life permitting, the greater physical value potential that there is. Now if that's true, a perfectly rational and value-oriented uh, creator God is very unlikely to make the vast majority of the uh, universe to be utterly hostile to that form of life. In other words, on theism, we'd expect the physical portion of the created world to reflect to some significant degree a degree of bias toward, or at least a compatibility with the highest form of physically instantiable value. Instead, we discover that the vast majority of the universe is not only utterly devoid 
of the highest form of physically instantiable value, but it is positively incompatible with its survival. And for these reasons, this staggering mismatch between the physical world as a whole and the highest form of physically instantiable value that we know of is significant evidence against theism and for naturalism. Now, for many of us, looking back in time at the horrors of deep evolutionary time and looking up at the darkness, the scale, and the absolute emptiness of space constitutes a kind of irreligious experience of our own cosmic fragility and our insignificance. Now, this fact brings me to my last bit of evidence, non-resistant non-belief and its distribution. Theism posits a perfectly loving God. What seems clear about the concept of perfect love is that love is relational and, and self-giving. Perfect love spills over, pushing beyond mere benevolence and toward a desire to be personally related um, with another for its own sake. Loving persons will also desire meaningful, explicit relationships with those they love because of the various ways in which those involved may stand to benefit from such a relationship. And this means that God, being perfectly loving, will always be open to a relationship with his loved ones, such that they can enter into a relationship with God just by trying. Now, because of this, and because it is a very good thing for people that they come to believe and identify themselves as uh, one, that they are created by a loving God, and two, that their infinite creator is open to relationship with their finite selves, God will meet his loved ones with the provision of causally sufficient reasons for belief in him. Anything less would fail to be perfect love. To highlight this, philosopher Schellenberg, sorry, philosopher J.L. Schellenberg insightfully asks, how could God at some point count as loving John or Joan as fully and as richly as God can if at that time John or Joan, or if at that time God, uh, sorry, if, I'm going to start over. <laughs> how could God at some time count as loving John or Joan as fully and as richly as God can, if God at that time is actually preventing John or Joan from being able to participate in any way in a meaningful, conscious relationship with God. Now certainly, resistance to God complicates matters here. Perfect love does not force itself on you. In cases of resistance then, God's hiding from these people it's not going to be God's failure here. Rather, it is the finite person that is the cause of that epistemic separation. But again, insofar as the person is not resisting theism, theism strongly suggests that God would always be open to relationship to such a person. Schellenberg puts it this way, and this is one of my favorite quotes of his. The presence of God will be for them like a light. That however much the degree of its brightness may fluctuate, remains on unless they close their eyes. However, there are some people who have their eyes wide open, and yet they still lack belief in God, and for that reason lack a meaningful conscious relationship with God. For example, many close friends of mine have lost their faith against their will and genuinely miss, miss it, but cannot convince themselves to return. They don't see the reasons. Their lack of belief is not the result of any epistemic or moral failing on their end. This non-resistant non-belief is extremely surprising on theism for the reasons already stated. Naturalism, of course, has no tension with the data of non-resistant non-belief because beliefs on naturalism are going to be like any other belief. Uh, believing God is going to be like any other belief um, in that they're going to vary and spread from person to person in a natural, organic way. Moreover, the distribution of non-resistant non-belief is lopsided across different populations and across time. 
For example, according to a 2018 survey, 94% of the population of Thailand is Buddhist and therefore not monotheistic. Or consider the native people, uh, the native peoples of the Americas prior to the age of exploration. What about the still isolated tribal peoples? The lopsidedness is surprising if the primary explanation for unbelief in perfect being theism is a moral or rational failure, right? We would have to say something like, these cultures are uniquely immoral or uniquely irrational, but that seems highly implausible. Moreover, naturalism has a ready-made explanation here. The explanation of the existence and distribution of non-resistant non-belief is that monotheism, again, is just like any other cultural idea in how it spreads both geographically and temporally. We wouldn't expect such ideas to be equally available to all individuals at all times. Therefore, the existence and the distribution of non-resistant non-belief is evidence favoring naturalism over theism. In review, I began this presentation by first drawing a contrast between, between naturalism as I see it and Eric's theism in terms of qualitative simplicity. I then argued that there are three facts about reality for which naturalism is a far better explanation than theism. One, the evolutionary evils experienced by sentient beings who are not moral agents. Two, the hostility of the universe to the survival of sentient beings who are moral agents. And three, the non-resistant non-belief and its distribution. In my next presentation, I hope to show why, uh, why the evidence that you've heard for theism this evening is not equally as strong. In light of naturalism's greater qualitative simplicity and the superior evidence here surveyed, we should accept naturalism over theism, all else being equal. Thank you. You can go ahead. Okay, good. The mic is on. So uh, I, as Eric is going up here, I just wanted to uh, let you guys know, I, sh I, I was going to mention this at the beginning, but something unique about tonight is that the, bo both of the debaters, Eric and Justin, actually swapped openings prior to tonight. And so they, what that meant is that they were actually able to prepare the rebuttals in advance. And they also swapped those. So you're in for a whole lot of substance. The substance is not over yet with these opening statements. We're about to get into uh, yet more. So just buckle up. I just wanted to let you know. <clears throat> All right. I'd like to begin by thanking Justin for his opening and for providing further evidence for my three arguments. Given that his opening implicitly conceded my arguments, we can once again conclude that therefore, atheism is false, theism is true. This is my, these are my other slides. Now, talk awkwardly amongst yourselves, please. I think Justin did it before he got down and that's my science. Okay. Oh no, that's his Oh, this is your slides now. Should I not look? with uh, things like this, having some technical issues. We're, we're going to get this sorted out. It looks like uh, Travis, our tech guy, is, is on it. So uh, in the meantime, <coughs> tell a joke. Sorry, what? <laughs> I have no jokes. Do you have any jokes, Brittany? Do you want to tell a joke up here? Uh, I'm not serious. You don't have to come up here. Um, I'm trying to figure out so, what to ask you. So one joke. <laughs> that we okay. may want to uh, highlight here is I could ask you, for example, do you recall how the dinosaurs died? A uh, big meteor came in. I, it was a, a sedimentary lifestyle. <laughs> Very nice. Can I pull the mic real quick? Oh, you, no, dude, we don't want to drop that one. <laughs> 
Oh, they missed the punchline. They lived a sedimentary lifestyle. That's a Shebra original. Yeah. Will someone get this working because this is going to be bad. <laughs> this is just going to get worse. <coughs> if atheism is true, good jokes do not exist. Good jokes do exist, therefore atheism is true. Uh, I, have, I actually have a lot of good questions that I want to ask, but I'm, I'm trying to save these for the, the open dialogue. So I'm, I'm sure. trying to refrain from doing that. Maybe um, while they're working on that, maybe Justin, you and I can talk about the debate that you and I had several years ago that oh, people okay, may yeah. not know about. Yes, yeah, so sure. you and I talked about the, the problem of evil, and uh, yeah. that was a lot of fun. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I like you so much is because of – how do I do this without insulting a whole lot of people? So, <laughs> Justin, I guess it goes both ways as well, is that not, not everyone really, really cares and has a love for the truth and is trying to do their best to study philosophy and come to the truth. I cry and, really easy. I need you to be careful. Do what? But I said I cry really easily, so don't... <laughs> Sunshine. And it, we're good. Um, <laughs> we're good. Well, yeah. No, I mean, that, that's one of the things that I really appreciated when we when we had our debate is that you care about philosophy. You care about trying to actually like go and read the best literature on both sides, and uh, that's just something that I really appreciate about you. Appreciate okay, you. but I think we're ready to go. So, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to start from the top. Okay. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Justin for his opening and for providing further evidence for my three arguments. Given that his opening has implicitly conceded my opening we can once again conclude that, therefore, atheism is false, theism is true, and God must exist. Thank you for your time, and please drive home safely. <laughs> but given that you came to hear a debate, let's evaluate his case. In this quote, Justin claims simplicity, simplicity by appealing to Occam's razor. But suffice it to say that Occam's razor is, at best, a tiebreaker if and only if it can be shown that both views explain the data equally. But if theism has better explanatory power, scope, and plausibility, then the principle of simplicity is the least of his worries. Now consider his definition of naturalism. This commits Justin to a sort of philosophical naturalism where all that exists is, in his words, a single basic type of stuff, which would presumably be purely physical entities, and as a result, commits him to a strict physicalist view of human beings. And given that their behaviors are governed by general natural laws, He's implicitly committed to determinism, making libertarian free will impossible. But unfortunately for Justin, this only plays right into my arguments. Recall that I argued that the features in my opening are all immaterial kinds of entities which would count in favor of theism over naturalism. So at this point, given Justin's definition of naturalism and commitment to simplicity, he now has two options. One, he can make these things identical or reducible to the physical, or two, he can eliminate them from his ontology. Well, I've already argued that the first option isn't possible, and so his only option is to deny that these exist. And yet, his entire case rests on the assumption that these can exist within his worldview. So, either way you slice it, his entire case is immediately undercut by his own standards, and thus his case collapses. Now consider his first argument. Again, he's assuming the existence of consciousness, evil, and biological life given naturalism. However, for any of his arguments to work, he'd have to show at least two things. One, that theism doesn't at least equally predict these, and two, that naturalism provides a better prediction and explanation of them. So beginning with the first assumption, he states, my argument starts with the fact that there are sentient beings. However, if consciousness cannot exist on Justin's worldview, and if suffering requires consciousness, then we actually shouldn't expect any suffering to exist on naturalism by default. Therefore, any argument that Justin provides requiring consciousness immediately becomes a problem for naturalism and insurmountably becomes evidence in favor of theism over atheism. So when Justin said in his opening that naturalism has no need for explanations or elaborations, this is simply false. Before even beginning the argument, Justin owes us a metaphysical explanation for how consciousness could arise in the first place given naturalism with only, and I quote, a single basic type of stuff existing. Next, he quotes Dawkins to express the evil of animal suffering. 
But this was unwise on Justin's part, given that Richard Dawkins, in the very same book he's quoting from, states that given naturalism, the universe has no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, which is precisely what I've argued for in my first contention, if God does not exist, and thus my point is conceded once again. Therefore, Justin's worldview cannot be the better explanation by default if these things cannot exist on naturalism to begin with. But if theism can at least predict and account for these, then it automatically becomes the better explanation over naturalism. And this is precisely what we find. Consider briefly three ways among many that theism both predicts and accounts for any suffering, including the suffering of animals. One, predictability. First, free will. The choice to do good includes the choice to enact evil. Two, greater good or soul-building theology, theodicies. Three, the fall of all creation, affect, the fall affecting all of creation, including animals. And now the explanation and theodicy. For 1a, God allows free will and evil, but uses it to develop us and our character teleologically. 2a, as Trent Doherty argues in his book, The Problem of Animal Pain, God allows and knows the evils sufficient in intensity and frequency required to bring about the greatest goods and the highest virtues. And 3a, the resurrection and restoration of all creation. And as Doherty argues that for animals, they will accept, though with no loss of the sense of the gravity of their suffering, that they were an important part of something infinitely valuable, and that in addition to being justly, lavishly rewarded for it, they will embrace their role in creation. And in this embrace, evil is defeated. His second argument. <clears throat> Again, sentience. But because I don't want to add to the amount of animal suffering by beating the proverbial dead horse, no pun intended, just kidding, that pun was totally intended, let's focus on the argument. Justin claims that this is significant evidence against theism and for naturalism. But this is actually the weakest of history arguments in my opinion. First, the entire argument is based on the assumption that if God existed, he would want the vast majority of the universe to be life permitting. But this is simply a false question-begging assumption on his part that isn't necessary, assumed, or applicable to theism. Second, in this quote, note how he assumes that if naturalism is true, moral agents would exist. Coincidentally, this only plays right into the hand of what's known as the teleological argument for God's existence. Put differently, if naturalism is true, then it's not the case that we would expect near hostility to life but rather, we wouldn't even expect life to begin with. In their book, A Fortunate Universe, Dr. Luke Barnes and atheist co-author Dr. Lewis respond to this very argument. And after going through all the data and probabilities about the existence of life to begin with, they state that the size and relative emptiness of the universe is not irrelevant to life, and that if you can understand why life cannot exist in the near vacuum of interstellar space, then you can understand why life needs a finely tuned universe. We could go on, but it suffices to say that this universe is not a waste of space. The vacuum, believe it or not, plays its role, its part in making our universe life permitting and discoverable. <clears throat> so again, naturalism fails on both predictability and explanatory power. Third, Justin said that God is very unlikely to do this and that this is somewhat surprising on theism. But it's important to point out that for the vast majority of history, God was seen as an artist prior to being seen as a designer. So to ask why God would create such a vast universe that may seem like a waste of space would be like to ask why a painter used so much blue in his artwork. Much like a gorgeous painting on a wall does not waste space but adds to the beauty of the room, so too the immense handiwork of the universe adds to the beauty of creation. His third argument, thank you for that amen, uh, again, we immediately find a false theological assumption on which his entire argument from divine hiddenness rests. Justin states that God, being perfectly loving, will always be open. But again, this is simply false, and more pertinently, theologically incorrect. As the prophet Isaiah clearly understood, truly you are a God who hides himself, and in the Gospels, Jesus literally hides his identity so that they would not believe, turn, and be forgiven. And while this suffices to undercut Justin's argument, we can still ask why God would hide himself. And for the sake of time, we'll only look at a few reasons, but keep in mind that we only need one possible reason to further undercut the argument. 
By way of preliminary remarks, note how Justin's argument focuses on belief in God. But it's important to understand that while belief in God may be a necessary condition for relationship with God, it is far from sufficient. After all, even the demons believe but tremble. Which brings me to the first reason God may hide himself. One, a person may be open to belief in God but not to relationship with God. In light of this point, I submit to you that the more revelation one receives, the more responsibility one obtains. But this would also mean that the more revelation one rejects, then the greater condemnation and punishment one brings upon themselves in the afterlife. So ironically, God's hiding himself from such a person actually becomes a sign of God's love, grace, and mercy towards that person. Meaning that even those who reject, despise, or even hate God, he still loves them enough to hide in order to alleviate and limit the amount of punishment they would incur upon themselves in the afterlife. But let's make Justin's case stronger by assuming a person given sufficient knowledge of God and is open to both belief and relationship with God, why would God hide from such a person? Well, if God is omniscient and something like apostasy is a genuine possibility, then as before, their greater revelation and now abandoned relationship with God would only compound their amount of punishment in the afterlife. So again, God's hiddenness becomes an act of love, grace, and mercy on such a person. But again, let's make Justin's case stronger and suppose that a person, given sufficient revelation, is open to belief, relationship, and will not apostatize. Why would God hide? Well, it's quite plausible that such hiddenness is temporary. If Justin were to give his life to Christ tonight, fingers crossed, then imagine the testimony that he would have built. After numerous debates, talks, blogs, and books against the existence of God, he now becomes a Saul of Tarsus in the making. And not only can this be said of Paul, but men like C.S. Lewis, Lee Strobel, J. Warner Wallace, and numerous others. So Justin, if God is truly hiding, and you're truly non-resistant in this third way, then don't lose hope, my hopefully soon-to-be brother. While there's still breath in your lungs, the decision remains yours. So in summation, one, Justin's argument in, arguments implicitly concede my arguments. Two, naturalism fails to predict and account for these features and therefore cannot be the better explanation. Three, theism prevails in predictability, explanatory power, scope, and plausibility. And therefore, given this debate, atheism is false, theism is true, and we can once again conclude that therefore, God must exist. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Eric, for that. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to be replying to Eric's opening statement. I will not be addressing the comments you just heard, uh, his criticisms of, of my arguments. Um, so most professional philosophers accept or lean toward atheism. And the same is true of moral realism. However, Eric's first argument makes the very bold claim, um, again, you have to remember back to the first presentation, make claim that uh, realism about moral value and obligation is incompatible with atheism. Eric supports premise one by claiming that teleology is necessary for morality. However, I disagree. It may be part of some meta-ethical systems, but it is not at all obvious that this is true of all meta-ethical systems. Secondly, Eric argues that atheism cannot account for the authority and prescriptive nature of morality. I disagree. One who, holds to the irreducib one who holds to irreducibly normative truths can claim the same authority for obligations as for the rational authority for not accepting the conclusions of invalid arguments. Reason is its own authority. 
On Eric's view, the prescriptivity of moral obligation comes from the fact that they are con by divine commands. However, as J.L. Mackey observes, oops, there we are, as J.L. Mackey observes, if a ruler tells you to do X, this makes it obligatory for you to do X only if it is already obligatory for you to do whatever that ruler tells you. The same applies to God. He can make it obligatory for us to do Y by so commanding only if there is first a general obligation for us to obey him. However, it's far from clear that there can be a non-viciously circular account of such an obligation to obey God's commands. Um, Eric argues that the universality and objectivity of morality shows that only God can ground morality. However, again, I disagree. Eric's theistic view, insofar as I understand it, is that goodness is rooted in the nature of a particular person, namely God. By definition, then, this is a form of meta-ethical subjectivism and is therefore not objective. Now, Eric calls the view objective because he defines objective in a relatively non-standard way. According to an apologetics handout available on Eric's website, Eric defines objective as being independent of human thought. Now, he's allowed to define words however he likes, but this very species-specific definition appears quite ad hoc. Moreover, if intelligent aliens invaded Earth and because of certain facts about their alien natures, they believed torturing our household pets was a morally valuable activity. One who holds to Eric's sense of objectivity of moral value would be committed to the view that torturing Fido would thereby be an objectively morally valuable activity. But of course, nobody thinks that. The upshot is this. It has not been shown that God is necessary for morality. Moreover, if we want a view that explains both the objectivity and the universality of the moral domain, that's a reason to adopt one of the many forms of non-theistic moral realism, because they take objectivity and the universality seriously. Moving on, Eric argues that the soul is evidence that God exists. In support of the soul existing, Eric claims that consciousness cannot be identical with nor reducible to purely physical stuff. Granted, I'm not sure, though, why this is a problem for atheism or even naturalism as I've defined it. One could be a Russellian monist, that is, one could be a structuralist about physics, thereby recognizing that while physics tells us a whole lot about the relations or dispositions of fundamental particles, it is largely silent about their intrinsic natures. And if that's correct, one who thinks consciousness uh, is irreducible, like myself, might think then that microphenomenal or protophenomenal properties exist at the fundamental level. No souls are required. Moving on, According to Eric, free will also supports the existence of souls. It's not exactly clear how. I'm a compatibilist. I think that if determinism does turn out to be true, I think that freely willed acts are not threatened. I subscribe to the idea that so long as the act flows from an agent's reason's responsiveness, the act counts as free in the relevant sense. No souls required. To be clear, Eric endorses a specifically libertarian view of freedom, and that's what's supposed to point to the soul. However, we've heard no argument for the claim that libertarianism is the correct view of the soul, and that's what, would, what we would need to bridge his argument to the conclusion. Rationality. Dang it, I am not keeping ahead of my slides here. So, um, rationality, moving on, Eric claims that my belief in atheism was causally determined and is therefore not rationally, was, was not rationally acquired. However, nothing about rationality is incompatible with also being causally determined. All parties, everyone here, can agree that uh, a paradigm example of rationality, the computer, is an entirely deterministic system. Now, it might be objected, of course, that a 
computers are designed, Justin. This doesn't help your point. But that may be true, of course, but uh, it's also dialectically irrelevant because recall that the original argument was that rationality is incompatible with being causally determined. And that's the claim I've shown to be false. Uh, Eric's argument from knowledge is easily the most interesting of the bunch. Uh, it is a variation of philosopher Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism. I'll be responding to Plantinga's formulation of the argument here. The charge, though, is the same as, as Eric's here. Uh, those who believe in naturalism and evolution thereby inherit a global defeater for all of their beliefs as a result, um, including their belief that naturalism is true and that evolution is true. Uh, the argument is up on the thing there, and to read it out would take too much of my time. So, in support of the argument, uh, Eric imagines a man who believes himself to be Superman, uh, but in an effort to keep his identity secret, he runs from danger um, to blend in with the rest of us. The point being, of course, that specific false beliefs can be adaptive in specific situations. Fair enough. However, a cognitive faculty with a tendency to produce false beliefs, false yet adaptive beliefs, is going to fall out of favor in the long run because we must navigate a wide variety of situations. For example, the beliefs of a man with a Superman delusion are going to spill into other aspects of his life. For example, believing that you have a secret identity is a recipe for social isolation, and that's going to affect your reproductive success. Perhaps Eric is just using this Superman analogy to gesture toward the much deeper accusation that Plandinga, sorry, Plantinga, um, raises in his defense of premise one. Briefly, Plantinga argues that on naturalism and evolution, all that matters is that our bodies move in the relevant ways toward the biological goals of survival and reproduction. Beliefs, strictly speaking, are unnecessary here. The, under, not, the underlying neurology of beliefs and their effect on behavior are all that are going to matter here. Um, insofar as belief holding mechanisms, uh, sorry, belief holding capacities evolve in a creature, belief content, according to Plantinga, could be anything. However, naturalists disagree with Plantinga's interpretation here. On non reductive views, for example, belief content will be associated with specific neurophysical properties, such that they will lead to behavior of some type rather than some other type when paired with specific desires. Suppose you're an alien creature on a distant planet and your cognitive faculties were produced by unguided evolution. Suppose further that you are, com that you are currently suffering from hunger pains and so you have a desire for food. Suppose sensory input to your neurology has produced the belief that there is food to my left when in fact there is food to your right. If the act recommended by the particular belief-desire combination fails to uh, lead to the appropriate resource securing behavior, you're going to be at an evolutionary disadvantage. Insofar as a belief is defined by its causal role then, the content of the belief and its fit with the environment will matter. For naturalists who think non-reductive views are probably true, they will believe that naturalism and evolution includes the aforementioned co connections and will thereby reject premise one. On the other hand, if God exists, his beliefs, while being necessarily true, are not the result of a designed cognitive faculty. If Eric wants to say that God's belief constitute knowledge, and again recall that Eric defined knowledge as justified, true, and believed, um, God may believe things and they may be true, but in order for them to be justified, that's the question. In order for it to count as, um, as knowledge rather than just true belief, he needs to show how that can be the case. But Eric needs to do so without conditionalizing on God's omnipotence to acquire said justification. That would be, of course, no different than a naturalist conditionalizing on their own reliability. When it comes to question begging, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. In closing, the evidence that we've heard for theism this evening is not equally as strong as the evidence for naturalism that I've presented. And if that's right, all else being equal, we should accept naturalism over theism. Additionally, naturalism's greater qualitative simplicity gestures us in that same direction. Thank you.
All right, I did let you guys know you were in for a challenging evening. And uh, what we should do now is, uh, well, the open dialogue is, is uh, most people that watch debates, like some of them just skip directly to this portion of the debate, but it's, it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna cover some more ground here. But before we do that, oh, can we put something else up on the screen? I think they'll, they'll take care of that. Uh, before we do that, I wanna tell everyone a little bit about what we do here at Capturing Christianity. So we are an online ministry primarily on YouTube. So we have a, a roughly 180,000 subscribers right now. We are a completely crowdfunded, donation-driven ministry. And events like this, uh, this is actually the very first event that we've done that is 100% free. So everyone that is here, uh, well, most of everyone that we did have, we originally launched everything. We had some like tickets that we sold. And I think uh, we've got one Emerson Green over here who, <laughs> Uh, he's like one of the only people that, that bought a ticket and, and we'd love to refund him. But um, we decided it, we were like, let's just make this free. Let's make this a free event. And we'd love to be able to do more of these, but they do cost money. And so if you would like to support a ministry like this, the purpose of Capturing Christianity is to expose the intellectual side of Christian belief. If you would like to join us and support us, uh, please get with us after, or you can, we, we handed out these little cards. You can go to capturingchristianity.com slash donate, give a one-time donation, or you can even become a monthly donor, and we would really, really appreciate that. So throughout this night, I've, uh, my wife was even telling me after I, I came up here and gushed over Justin again, she's like, you haven't said a single nice thing about Eric. <laughs> so let me say, let me say one nice thing. So uh, I think what you're, I think what you're going to see uh, during this, this, uh, this uh, moderated dialogue portion one of the things that I love about Eric, and I'm just always impressed when I see him do anything, especially in like a dialogue or a debate, he's super quick on his feet. So I think you're gonna enjoy that and, and see that tonight. There's your compliment. <laughs> there you go. All right, so <laughs> to, uh, to kick things off, we got, we got about 30 minutes and we're, we're already over on time, so uh, it's, it's almost pointless at this point. But uh, so I'll start 30 minutes of, of uh, open dialogue. And I, I thought it'd be fun to kind of start things off with actually talking about some things that the two of you agree on, because you've highlighted each of you have highlighted like you've highlighted three things that you think, you know, best predicted by theism or best explained on theism. You've got three on, on eight or that, that support naturalism. But what are some things that the, the two of you guys agree on? Let's start there. Uh, yeah. So I think that. Um this is actually an interesting point that you bring up because there is, there was in the process of writing our replies, as, as Cameron said, we did exchange our opening statements and our replies to each other, our rebuttals. Um, and in that process, uh, I noticed that there had been a difference in interpretation. So um, if you recall uh, my opening um, in which I defined naturalism, I referred to a single basic type of stuff. Um, I do believe that, but what I mean by stuff, I recognize that there was an ambiguity here. Um, what I mean by that is that I believe that there is a single basic type of concrete entity. And what that means, uh, it does not have to do with uh, asphalt and things like this. Uh, what this has to do with, um, in philosophy, you have different kinds of things. You have your concrete entities. These are things which can stand in causal relations. You have abstract entities. These are things that do not stand in causal relations. Um, when I was reading out that definition, I interpreted a single basic type of stuff to refer to uh, concrete entities. I think there's only ultimately one kind of concrete entity. Uh, that said, um, when Eric was composing his rebuttal, he interpreted that as saying um, that I believe that there is nothing but that single concrete entity or that single type of concrete entity. So, um, but this isn't true. So I, I have a broader ontology than that. I, have, I believe that more things exist than mere concrete entities. So for example, um, and this is where we come to common ground. So Eric and I both uh, accept the existence uh, of, well, we are both moral realists. Um, that is to say that we both believe in moral properties, uh, that there are 
states of affairs that uh, can be correctly described or can be described appropriately as, as bad or good uh, for various um, reasons. And so um, another one is uh, consciousness. So I part ways with a number of, of atheists in that I think consciousness a, is, a, is a real substantive thing. And I'm also very suspicious that it can be reduced to pure physical concrete entities like we were talking about. Um, and so for that reason, I think, and, and so because I was talking about the structuralism about physics, wherein I think that physics does a fantastic job of telling us about the relations uh, and dispositional properties of uh, fundamental particles, it doesn't really tell us anything about the, like the actual intrinsic nature of these particles. And I think that, okay, well, if I, from my perspective, I think I, I you know, recognize that fact, and then I also recognize the fact that consciousness, the thing that I'm experiencing, the one thing that is most undeniable for me, uh, then it must be the case, or at least I think it quite plausible, that uh, there is something about consciousness at the base level of reality. Um, so I think that, for example, perhaps there are some very kind of proto-phenomenal properties or micro-phenomenal properties such that when in complex uh, uh, combinations or uh, processes that they bring about consciousness. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I guess that's addressing that uh, difference in interpretation of that definition of naturalism I think is good to kind of start this portion off uh, with. Um, so, yeah. Thoughts, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and we had, you know, exchanged emails uh, on this, but, you know, one thing I had said is, you know, because some naturalists will still use a definition even in the way I interpret it, but say that these immaterial properties, which you seem to hold to, like moral realism and things like that, even conscious properties, that they're somehow... They're, they, it, it, they usually take a weak ontological reduction to this and say that they're caused by or dependent on or instantiated by these physical properties done in the last. But he, here's, where I, here's why I, I still say that you should hold to the way I've interpreted it. Um, like just one example, we're talking about consciousness and um, you, know, you hold to like a Rossilian monism yeah. and you said that you know, panpsychism is a version of... Their, their, I forgot you just yeah, yeah, that's, that's, there's a, a small family of, our, of uh, views that kind of belong under that larger umbrella term. I don't know which one is true. Sure. I think that, that something like it is, is probably the case. And, and what I think is interesting here um, is that, because you say at the fundamental level of reality, there's consciousness of some sort. So there are, so the things that stand in the relations, the, the things identified by physics, the fundamental particles, whatever those end up being at the most fundamental level, uh, what's clear is that they can stand in these um, uh, relationships, these uh, causal relationships, but what I'm saying is that there's some, there's some other aspect that's, that's sci that science is blind to. Uh, physics is going to be utterly silent on the intrinsic nature of these things. And that tells me, okay, well, if consciousness is undeniable for me, there's got to be something more that science is missing. So, so then there would be some type of conscious bits at that fundamental level? Perhaps, yeah. Uh, another possibility would be uh, like that they're proto-phenomenal properties. Um, they're just going to be different aspects of those uh, fundamentals. <clears throat> and, and the reason I ask is because it seems that if we would both agree, if we have the common ground that at the fundamental level of reality, there's consciousness, and I don't see why you just don't become a Christian, because that's what Christians believe, that at the fundamental level of reality, everything comes from God's mind. Yeah, there is some very broadly defined common ground there as well, yes. Um, but, I mean, you know, obviously, you've got a whole theology behind you. I'm just inferring from the unmistakable fact of consciousness and the unmistakable limits of our scientific tools. And I think it's kind of, in my opinion, it's telling that some naturalists have started to see, like, you know, Wielenberg, you hold to a theory like his, yeah. that morality is not reducible to the physical. So then you have these immaterial moral properties. And then you have other people like Nagel and, and others like that who say, well, now it even seems like consciousness is not reducible to the physical. So, I mean, at, at what point is, is um, 
I don't know, at what point do these things become ad hoc to where you're kind of picking and choosing what you would like to fit? Yeah. And, and I, you know, there's um, scholar, atheist scholars who would say, well, let's not go there. So I quoted, um, you know, Frank Jackson, um, who said that if naturalism is to have superior explanatory power mm -hmm. and then your commitment to simplicity, it seems like you're going to want to reduce those, but you don't. So it seems like you're losing simplicity and even explanatory power. Yeah, I mean, I don't, so it's true that I'm, okay, so... It is certainly true that pure physicalism that says there's just those things that stand in causal relations, it is certainly true that if you say there's another aspect to those uh, basic entities, if the, then of course, yes, there is a, an increase, uh, or a, rather a decrease in the simplicity, right? Um, but what I would say is that uh, you know, you referred to this as being um, possibly uh, subject to accusations of ad hocery, but I don't think that's true because, again, I'm, I'm making a very clean inference here. Um, it is the fact that I... A, a very what, I'm sorry? A very, a very clean inference. Clean. I'm not... I'm, my point being is that it's not unmotivated in the sense that uh, what I'm... My view is, is that, okay, consciousness seems real. It seems irreducible. We agree, we can't reduce consciousness down to the billiard balls aspect of physics, right? So there's some common ground. Um, and when I accept that, and then I also recognize the limits of science, that it cannot tell us about the intrinsic natures, what falls out of that? What falls out of that is a very weird view, <clears throat> but it's one that I think given my views on these things, I, would, I should adopt. And, and can you see how someone from the outside yeah. would see that as, well, in Christianity, it seems to be much more plausible. And, you know, there's, you know, atheist scholars would say that, yeah, these irreducible consciousness, moral properties seems to fit better on theism where you have these things to begin with, a conscious mind at the beginning. But then if you have just a concrete, single basic type of stuff, even if it's just concrete yeah. stuff, well, don't you see how that would actually seem to fit better on theism? I, I, I see how someone could look at that and wonder why I don't go further. What if I, I'm sorry? Wonder why I don't go further. Oh, okay. Right? So what I would say is that, okay, well, on theism, um, at least, I mean, there's obviously uh, philosophers, you can find a philosopher adopting and holding any view, right? So, but generally speaking, on theism, you have a, a, uh, a fundamental duality between the physical and the mental. Um, those are, so you have a, so whereas my view is monist with dual properties, you could say. Right. Um, your view is going to be dualist, right? Um, Can I interject real quick? Yes. Because I think you're a dualist too. You're just a property dualist at that point. But again, it's going to be the, uh, the, the uh, what's the word I want to use here? they can reduce down to a uh, fundamental. So it's a different aspect of a kind of neutral substance in a way. Well, sure, sure, and that's why I initially interpreted that as the way you said it, because again, yeah. people, who, people could always just claim it's, it's still physical, but because it's dependent or called Right, 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 right. So... Yeah, so when I say <laughs> using the word physical is a difficult thing to do here, because when I'm, when I'm saying, like, it's hard, these words mean different things in different contexts, right? So when I want to say, when I say physical, and I'm talking about like philosophy of mind stuff, if I'm using the word physical, I'm talking about the purely billiard ball aspect of fundamentality. What I'm not talking about is that that's all there is. So yeah. hopefully that yeah, no, makes and, that, and we can move on for this, uh, because and sure. that's why I would just go back to say, and that seems to fit better on theism than it would some naturalist. Well, let's, let's do this. So, uh, we've been, th this is a very abstract topic, and <laughs> I feel like just a little eyes bit. are just kind of let's get glazing over and like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the laugh is, I think, uh, confirming that. So, let's do this. Let's move on to a subject that both of you have actually talked about in your opening statements, and that is evil. You've used evil Yep. to support God's existence, you used evil to negate God's existence. So let's sort of see some back and forth uh, about your, your respective positions on that. 
Uh, yeah, so, so one thing I do want to respond to, I mean, I, I doubt we'd be able to get to everything. Um, he talked about my definition of being objective, um, and I'm looking for it. Uh, how, did you, how did you characterize it? Uh, so, yeah, so the general, at least if I'm understanding you correctly, and it's mm -hmm. entirely possible that I have no idea what I'm talking about with regard to your view in particular, um, but the view that I, uh, at least from comments you had said, I've inferred you to have, is a view that states that moral, that, that things are, um, that moral value exists and that it can only exist mm -hmm. because God exists. So things are only valuable, things are only good or evil depending on how well they line up with the standard that you were referring to in your opening, right, with God. God is a person, um, and if we're talking about the nature of that person, just like if I were to say, um, I'm going to base my opinions on the, 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 the moral behavior of Cameron and the nature of Cameron, right? That. that would be a Don't subjectivist <laughs> view, right? Um, and I think that there's no, there's no non-ad hoc, no non... Uh, and are you saying that's because he's a subject that makes it yes, subjective? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, and so in the same sense, God being a person, uh, he is a subject in the sense that we're talking about, um, then yeah, this would, it would mean that this is a subjectivist um, meta-ethical view. Yeah. And this is, a, this is a non, this is not a controversial fact about how that term is defined. Now, it might be that you don't care about that, right? It might be that, well, you're, it's, it's objective in the sense that you care about, and that's fine, you know, that's, that's just going to be a matter of, of linguistic difference here. Um, well, well, a few things. So, yeah. the, the, so, and I found, you know, what you're saying that Eric calls his view objective because he defines it in a non-standard way, and that I define objective uh, objective morality as not being as being independent of human thought. Yeah. Um, but actually, throughout the history of the way this has been defined, that's actually pretty common. So I have here a quote from an atheist moral philosopher, uh, Schaefer Landau, mm -hmm. and he explains it in his book *Moral Realism*. Uh, he says that the theory that moral judgments enjoy a special s sort of objectivity, such as judgments when true, are so independently of what any human being anywhere in any circumstance whatever thinks of them. So this, is, this seems to be a pretty standard definition because the contrast is to contrast it with subjective morality, which would, mm -hmm. would necessarily be dependent on human thought and opinion. So I don't, um, but you know, again, maybe it could just be semantics, but... Yeah, I think it's going to matter because he's not really... He's, he doesn't really take theism seriously, right? So when he's, talk, when he's writing meta-ethics, he's going to use a definition that's going to be, that doesn't really account for the possible existence of God, right? But if we're really talking about objective in the substantive sense in which it does not in any way rely or is based or grounded in a particular person or the nature of that person, if that's the kind of, like, base level, like, ultimate objectivity that we want, then I think we have to reject uh, theistic views uh, of well, uh, meta-ethics. So, so a few things. Uh, a great book I'd recommend is by Adam Johnson, uh, recently, not so long ago, came out, Divine Love Theory, and, and he, he makes a lot of great points, one of which is that, um, you know, obligations aren't necessarily to persons, and that, um, I forget who else says that, to have this absolute standard, if moral is absolute, and these properties point to it being grounded in a person, then you would need an absolute person to have this absolute standard. Um, and then the... So, could you, you repeat that? You, you said, just repeat like the base thing you were just um, saying? He says, and I'm trying to remember exactly what he said, but that, um, and this is a different philosopher, but that, that's quoted in Adam's book, that uh, if morality is personal, because, so uh, moral obligations are between persons, right? I'm not obligated to some abstract law. Um, oh, yeah, no, I disagree, yeah. Oh, so you think we are obligated to abstract laws? Uh, I think that abstract laws are reason-providing, um, yeah. Well, okay, so that's another thing is you, you said that reason is its own authority, but reason... Exactly, yeah. Reason, we don't owe anything to reason. Uh, we're not obligated to reason. I have obligations to persons. But reasons are necessarily reasons for acting. That sounds tautologous. What do you mean? Hmm? That, that sounded tautologous. I'm not sure what you mean. I guess I'm, I'm not connecting with what your worry is here. I don't see any worry. Um, you're saying that, like, obligations necessarily entail some obligation to a person. 
And I just, I just outright reject that. I don't think that that's true at all. Well, what about like animals? Like, don't, don't we have obligations to animals? To okay, yeah, no, sure. Um, so, so good point. So when, when we're talking about morality, we could say that we're, so if I, I'd modify it and say we're obligated to sentient beings, to other sentient beings, would you agree with that? Or that that's an, it encompasses that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, insofar as they're, yeah, yeah, generally, yes. And, and, and I didn't know that you held to this, but it sounds like you're saying that we do have, though, obligations to these abstract concepts that are not sentient. So what obligations are is what I'm saying. I'm saying that we don't have obligations to abstract concepts. It's that uh, abstract concepts uh, are reason-providing. They just are what obligations are. So it's not as though I'm... I, it's not as though I'm obligated to some abstract object or something. It's that those uh, provide, re those are inherent, those are uh, irreducibly normative concepts. So, um, yeah, it's not, it's not a person or, yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'm, I think there's just a disconnect here. I'm not really matching up with what your worry is here. Um, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. We're not obligated to abstract objects, but reason? Are, are we obligated to reason? Like, is reason a thing that we're obligated to? Yes. So, well, no, what I'm saying is that, like, re so when, so, okay, let's say, um, uh, you know, whether or not you want to accept the conclusion of, like, a valid argument, right? Um, so then, okay, well, then you say, okay, what, what am I, what should I do, All right? I'm saying that uh, that the nature of a valid argument just is a reason to accept the conclusion of that argument. It's, the, it's intrinsic. It's, well, I agree with It's that. reason providing inherently, yeah. But I'm not obligated to a reason. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you, you, that's like a weird way to put it, I guess. I don't, I mean... <laughs> I, I don't really see it that way, or, I guess. Maybe, maybe I should just ask a question. Where, where do our obligations arise from? They, they don't arise from things, right? So they are going to be that there are reasons, and I, I feel like I'm, we're just disconnecting fundamentally here. Like, I'm just, I don't see the obligations in the way that you see them. You think of it as a, uh, we have like an higher, a higher authority, right? You're interpreting it through your lens. I, I just don't, there's just a disconnect here. Well, that's why I'm asking. On yeah. your view, where do obligations come from? I, I, again, so, again, to, going back to the valid argument, right? If a valid argument has a conclusion, then the nature of that reason is a reason providing, uh, it's just intrinsically reason providing you should accept it. Right, but I'm, but I'm asking about obligations. I, I can have reasons for something, but not be obligated oh, 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 oh. to do that. So obligations are just uh, things that you have the most reason to do. I'm, tr I'm processing that. Obligations are what we have the most reason to do. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I'm having, so again, if we go back to where this conversation began, right, um, are you denying that this is a subjectivist meta-ethical view? Yes. Okay. Yes, sure. So when you say subjective, or when you say objective, you're carving out a particular species. What is your justification for that? Like, so, that seems yeah. utterly arbitrary and ad hoc. So we could even modify it. So yeah. again, going back to, this is why I also inquired about Adam Johnson's book. Sure, up, sure. You, you referenced Cameron. Well, I, I would think morality would have to be necessary. And, and I'll say this, even though we disagree, but... You know, it also has to be grounded in something personal, um, and it would have to be eternal if necessary, and I would say that's best grounded in God. Now, why would it, why would it not, how is it not ad hoc? Um, well, because if those things follow, and if these moral properties are kind-defining properties, it would seem that we need something necessary, eternal, and personal just with those alone. He's not necessary, nor is he eternal. He's a great guy, but he's none of those things. So it would seem that we would need a necessary, eternal, personal, transcendent being to ground these things in. And so it's not subjective. Yeah, I don't, I don't oh, see And that. it's not subjective because it's the, these... these um, it's not subjective the, because you're tying it to a person. 
That's my worry. That's where I'm having a hard time. Right, and I don't see how you can have uh, moral properties and, and, think, and obligations without person. That's fair, but I'm not redefining any words, right? Well, I don't think I am either. Um, okay. if, you ha- if, if God's nature is necessary... Then he's somehow objective? Well, it would be how does that follow? The, the standard would be objective. So, uh, the standard would be objective, but the standard would be objective in the sense that he is applying it to things. This person named God is applying it to things. So, if I were to uh, apply a standard to everyone here, that would be objective in the sense that I'm applying it to everyone, but it's a subjective mm-hmm. standard. That's where my disconnect is. So a, a common misconception about divine command theory, and, and, and I like how Adam Johnson has laid it out where he, he calls his divine love theory, is a common misconception is that um, all commands come from God, all obligations come from God's command um, or from his will, but we would argue that the standard is not grounded in his will, but his nature, and his nature is unchanging. It's necessary. It's eternal. So you're, it, I don't see how that would so be. So why should I, why, wh- where does the obligation to obey God's nature come from, I guess? <laughs> well, I, I, I could ask. pull a page from your book and say because the reason being is that if God is perfect and it's good to love perfect things, then okay. we should... Okay, so it's just a groundless axiom, a moral axiom. I wouldn't say it's, it's groundless. I would say it's groundless. Well, you just told me that you wanted to take from my view. Oh, and that's well, I was, I was trying to find a point of contact because if you're okay with using reasons to have obligations. Sure, then. well, yeah, I, maybe it might be best to move on. I'm okay. not know that, I don't know that this is going to be a predictive, a productive Okay. Uh, conversation. Sure. Um, Why don't we, well, that, so that was one aspect. That was kind of like Eric's, sure. in his opening statement, he was giving an argument for this. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it, we could turn yeah. to his yeah, version of the, the argument from evil, which is about suffering and... and yeah, and I mean, so so if you, recall, if you recall from my opening, right, I, I argued that, oh, I, in my first argument, I referred to uh, suffering that results from like evolutionary processes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that, these, that the instances of suffering that do result, many of them are the result of uh, like almost a kind of teleology, right? So there is, it, is, it is the case that there are animals whose body plans appear to be functioning in proper ways when they're tearing into the bodies and eating the flesh of other animals. Is this the kind of teleology you're referring to? Uh, so now, so if you recall from what I was saying is there's predictability, and one of those predictability yeah. is that the fall would affect all creation. Okay. Um, if, if you would take my version of theism, in heaven there's going to be line, line, uh, line, line with the lamb. Yeah, so before we get to that, I do want to address the fall, because um, that's going to be a, a separate point from the, the kind of animal afterlife stuff, and I, those are rich topics that we could probably talk all day on. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the fall, what... Could you, like, define the fall? Like, tell me what that is. Because, like, I grew up in, like, an evangelical context, young earth creationism. I'm thinking Adam and Eve in the garden. I'm thinking someone eats an apple. I'm thinking uh, this predates animal suffering, right? Um, That's not something that I'm assuming that we're not using that kind of story when we're referring to um, the fall. I, I would leave it open, so I, I think it can... Oh, you would leave it open as to whether young earth creationism is true? Sure, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't think it's necessary for the argument nor for Christianity to be true. Um, so, I, th- I mean, there, there have been uh, numerous ways people have hashed that out. I, one, one interesting one to bring up is uh, I've heard someone say that it could be that God knowing man would fall... So, well, let me start where you asked about the fall. Yeah. So um, God put men in charge, and by their disobedience, there was something that affected all creation, according to Christianity, including animals, plants, everything. Yeah. So that would have a worldwide effect on things. And, if, and then if that effect happened, then it was not God's... Yeah. So there was something about this that has deviated from a, an actual original teleology. Yeah. And so if we look in heaven that there's not this, then there seems to be something to be said that this is perhaps not what he wanted, and... So prior to, so let's, let's put ourselves conceptually prior to the fall. Mm-hmm. And we, what, what would we observe? Are we talking about a vegetarian ecosystem? <clears throat> so here's where I was gonna uh, point to. I've heard some older creationists talk about how God knowing the fall would happen could still retroactively have put that in place leading up to that. So there could have been uh, that kind of stuff happening. Wait, sorry, um, could it, you repeat that one? I didn't that, catch that. That God knowing the fall would happen could have had that, allowed that from the beginning. 
from that, this non-vegetarian option, so to speak. Oh, okay. So it was determined that the fall would occur. No, I don't... Why would, well, I would, uh, how would that come be on. <laughs> no, well, I'm curious. You, you made the claim. How would, explain how that would be determined. Are you saying if knew, So follows? if God has a belief, the fall happens, uh -huh. and then we move forward in time. If the fall does not happen, then we've retroactively shown God to be wrong about that belief. So are you saying that it, the belief in God, that the fall happens, is there any possible world in which that becomes false at time fall? <laughs> so it sounds, <laughs> sounds like you're asking two different questions. Can, could the fall have been false? And then I think you're implicitly asking, could God have falsely known something that wasn't going to happen? To answer the first question, yes, there's a possible world in, that did happen. Whether or not it's feasible is a different question. So there's a possible world in which the fall did not happen? Logically possible, but I don't think feasible. So okay, well, remember though, it was contingent on the fact that there's God over here prior to the fall believing that the fall happens. You're telling me that there's a possible world in which God believes the fall happens, but in which the so, fall does not happen. So there's a lot of things being brought up at once. Yeah, yeah, one, certainly. One, one, one there's thing two. I, well, I think those things have implications. That's why I say a lot. So it seems first you're assuming that foreknowledge is causal. Is that what I'm hearing? It doesn't need to be, no. So then when I, when I say determined, I mean theologically determined, right? So we don't need to talk, it doesn't need to be limited to causal. And that, you, you're aware of that. That's not, um, well, that's not, a, think that's not a causal determinism. I think theological determinism is still causal determinism. And I would reject that. Okay. So, so then it, I, don't see how that, I don't see how God's foreknowledge would make it determined on either definition of determined. I guess I'm confused. Maybe we're just using these words in very different ways. But let's set that aside then. Um, so back to the fall. What I was curious about is if we step conceptually prior to it, what kind of predictions would you make given sinful, a, a sin, the first sin? Like, is there a mechanism that rearranges nature such that now animals are eating each other rather than plants? Like, what is the exact... Because, like, I understand that you're saying the fall, and, like, I get it. Theology has to explain the data on the ground, and so theology is going to say, way back when, this is how we got to this thing here. But it doesn't seem like there's any possible predictive power of a fall. Like, what kind of mechanism brings us from a peaceful garden wherein all the animals are vegetarians to <coughs> now they have body plans that are designed to tear each other apart. You know what I mean? Like, that's, like does, your, does the fall have any actual precision in its ability to predict anything, I guess? So unfortunately, Eric, this is going to have to be your last one. We're, we're out of time. We've got to move on. So okay. just oh. respond um, to how, this and then we'll move to How precise? I don't know. But if I understand you correctly, it sounds like you're asking, could we predict that if we don't line up with God's perfect plan, bad things are going to happen? Absolutely. Bad things are going to happen is a very broad thing, and it does not say Evil. anything about the kinds of creatures that might happen after that, right? Right. And that's what I'm challenging you and, to and explain. And I'm oversimplifying that. It seems like you're asking a question that would almost be, no one would have to ask. If I don't line up with God's plan, will there be horrible, crazy, bad consequences? I would say yes. Okay, okay I want to say one more thing, and you can have the last word on this. Um, according, for a theodicy to work in explaining... The, the evil that is being referred to um, in any kind of given argument from evil, for a theodicy to work, it needs to be more probable than its negation given theism. Uh, and it also needs to, like, it also needs to be the case that the conjunction of theism and that theodicy explain the data. And I'm trying to push you to do those because you've said it's a theodicy but you've given me no meat to assess so well at this point we're talking about predictability not theodicies right right but remember merely having bad stuff happen that doesn't tell me anything it would predict that there would be evil and suffering in the world by falling out of god's telos original telos but again, the kind, remember that my first argument wasn't just that bad stuff happens, therefore no God. I mean, you have to give me something more than that, right? I specifically referred to the predation, right. the parasitism, mm -hmm. and the privation, the lack of resources. And nothing about the fall gives me any kind of like fine-grained explanation well, I, I don't for the things so, I'm referring to. Again, like I was saying on theism, in heaven it seems that there is no predation. So it would seem to imply to me, and even if 
e even if I were to grant, I don't know how far the prediction would go, but evil would happen. And as I look into the world, I say, oh, this must be the kind of evil that happens. And God allows us to remind us how bad disobedience is. And then I look at heaven and say, oh, there's actually not going to be predation. Then it gives me good reason to believe and predict that the more bad stuff we do or disobedience, the more evil there will be in the world. Okay. I said he'd cut the last point, so <laughs> okay. you go ahead. Okay. I, I was going to say, I was, like, I was kind of okay with just going a little bit longer and like oh, maybe sure. eating into the Q&A a little bit, but yeah. um, let, let's go ahead and move to, to Q&A now. I mean, we could go for hours <laughs> talking about all these things. So what we're going to do, if you have a question for either debater tonight, please go ahead and line up. The way that this is going to work, line up on this side of the aisle. Go ahead and come all the way forward. And uh, there's going to be a microphone set up here at the front. And uh, if you have a question, then you can just come up to the front and ask your question. And we're, we're going to do what we can to try to alternate between the two. That's probably not going to be able to work. Uh, but we don't want to block the aisle. So if you do have a question, come up on that right side. And uh, please ask your question very quickly. <coughs> don't, uh, don't take like, you know, well, I guess line up on this side. Sorry. So... Uh, no, this side. Yeah, you're you're, you're right. Yeah, um, try to try to try to express your question in about a sentence. You know, uh, just just don't take too long. And uh, the way that it's going to work is whoever it is addressed to. We should have talked about this before we went live. Sure. Um, we're we're going to figure this out. Yeah, I know. So uh, we'll do two minute responses and then a one minute counter response. How does that sound? That's fair. Good. Cool. Okay. So who's your question for? Yeah. Hi, Eric. So. I'll try to make as quick as possible. So we kind of touched on this a little bit before, but I wanted Can to... Can you lean a little bit closer? Yeah, I wanted to ask specifically if you could touch on um, the arguments around objective morality that we're, we, we discussed just earlier. So um, it's been argued that objective moral values are rooted in God's nature, and you kind of touched on that a little bit, and not necessarily just his will. God may have, you know, subjective feelings and and thoughts, but those aren't uh, the basis of the moral value of obligation. Could you, could you kind of go a little bit deeper into that, you know, and talk about the incompatible nature with uh, subje his subjective feelings versus the nature of his, him being morally good? <clears throat> um, if I understand your question correctly, so God's nature is unchanging, it's necessary, eternal and whatnot, and uh, it, it sounds like you're asking, if I'm understanding you correctly, usually it's asked this way, could God command something not good or evil? Right, right. Okay, right, and I'd say the answer is no, because uh, his nature would constrain what he would or would not command. If God is necessarily perfect and all good, well, then it becomes a contradiction to say, can an all-perfect God command something not perfect or not good? Right, exactly. That's my question. I, I just wanted you to comment on that one. Okay. Because it was something that was kind of touched upon, but you guys didn't quite delve deep into the nature of God and how that related to ob objective moral value. Yeah. Any, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I don't think there's anything about um, being eternal, uh, even necessary, that rules out the fact that God is a person and things that flow from his nature, just like things that flow from my nature, are going to be subjective by definition. Um, I don't think that that's, a, that's not a massive problem. I just think that we should call a spade a spade. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, John Buck. Hey. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Justin. Yeah. So if it would be, like, the best thing for God to sort of, like, reveal himself to all people at any moment of time, just because he's always loving in that sort of fashion, could it possibly be better for people to also like help other people to reveal God's love for them through their own causal contribution. So like if two people debate and like one person comes to learn of God's love through the help of the other debater, yeah. there's a sense in which there's both God revealing that as well as the debater. And so you have yeah. these two sort of like actors sort of bringing about this great good thing rather than just one in one case. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a fantastic point. So um, I think, okay, so... The, the good being appealed to here is like mutual, uh, you know, finite beings working together on a common goal to learn something. Mm. And I think that, yeah, that's obviously a good thing, right? Um, the relevance to the hiddenness argument, though, 
God's love is love. Um, if you're perfectly loving, that has certain uh, entailments to it. Um, what I would say is that these projects, these cooperative projects, are entirely uh, compatible with them believing in God's existence. It does not make sense to me to say that the only kind of uh, good cooperative project is that specific one about whether or not God exists, when you have not only what does it mean that God exists, what is God's nature, God is an infinite being. We can work together to discover the beauty, the layers, the depth of the divine. That, to me, is the project that, if God existed, would be at the heart of the universe. And the mere superficial question of whether he exists or not seems, relatively speaking, like not something God's going to hide for. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what I would say. (laughs) Eric? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I gave reasons why, why God would hide. I, I think there are plenty of reasons why God would hide, aside from the ones I mentioned. But I, I, think, it's, it's, um, I think this is another reason. I think it's what he was alluding to. For example, in our debate, there were some things I looked into that I looked much deeper into that I hadn't looked as deeply before. So I'd like to thank you for allowing God to use you in my life. And same. So go ahead and well, study and look into this. So you know, the universe or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. No. Something monism, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So this question's for Justin. But before that, I want to say, hey, great. And seriously, I really thought you made a good case. Uh, you too, Eric, too. Um, <laughs> Nobody's complimenting me today. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are both great. Um, so a question for Justin. So um, yeah. I know you said, um, so when you said that rationality has nothing, or rationality has nothing to do with being determined, uh, do you think you could clarify that one a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, in that comment, I was referring to a specific claim, um, at least insofar as I interpreted it correctly. The claim was that because Justin believes in determinism, that, uh, you know, it, or if determinism is true, then beliefs that form within that context um, and then I end up believing something that I did not do so rationally, right? The, so there's the base assumption here is that there's an incompatibility fundamentally between doing something rationally or a rational process and it being also determined, right? So that's the claim I was responding to. And in response, I said that uh, computers are a uh, kind of determined and like almost the most purely determined and purely rational thing we can think of. And so it seems to me that there's a clear counterexample to this kind of general principle. And so I think that the argument that is based on that principle should be rejected. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Yeah, briefly, uh, for the sake of time, I'd point uh, people to a paper by my good friend Tim Stratton and J.P. Moreland. Um, It's called the An Explanation and Defense of the Free Thinking Argument. Um, So if, if... you are determined, let's say you're determined by a, a non-rational person, then you would have reason to believe your thoughts aren't rational. Um, I wouldn't say computers are rational. Uh, it's whether they're quote unquote rational or not is gonna depend on the programmer. But if you have an irrational programmer uh, programming a computer, then to say two plus two equals the square root of negative 36, that's clearly not rational. And I would say on your view, it's not just that all your thoughts are determined by definition by things that are non-rational to begin with. and so. It seems like you're getting rationality out of non-rationality, and I would point more to the paper, but yeah. All right. Oh, my question's for Eric, and I was just wondering what your response was to Justin's response to Plantinga's evolutionary argument. Sorry, it's really hard to hear you. Could you slow down a little bit? Is this good? Yeah, yeah, slow down a little bit. Okay, slow down. Okay, so it's for Eric. Um, (laughs) And I was wondering what your response was to Justin's response to Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism. Got it. Um, yeah, so his response to Plantinga's argument. So um, quite, quite a few things, um, and there was a few things he said, so if I miss one, let me know, or if you wanted me to touch on something particular. Um, so like he, he talked about, I felt like at one point he was arguing my illustration as opposed to the principle of it, but then you know, maybe he wasn't because he said, well, maybe Eric's alluding to something else. But like even, even with, with what I was, the illustration I used, he said something like someone who thinks they're Superman or has a secret identity is going to lead to isolation and, and what was it, less uh, reproduction or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, 
Well, well, actually, no, I don't think that would be the case because someone who thinks they're Superman, even though it's false, is going to give them a boost of confidence. And even if they're striking out nine times out of ten, they're going to try more often and probably be more successful. So even then, I mean, I don't, I don't think it applies. Nevertheless, um, he, he, he's appealing to, uh, and may, maybe or maybe not, Stephen Law talks about CCs, these uh, conceptual constraints on neural physiological properties. I don't think there are any. Um, Nevertheless, at the end of the day, it's not the case that your belief has to be true because what matters are the neurological structures that cause certain behavior, and I would just reiterate, they don't have to be true to cause adaptive behavior to begin with. Um, so when it comes to the evolutionary argument against uh, naturalism, the most interesting part of that is its effect on our metaphysical beliefs. Um, and so if, like, that's the, seems to me like the most interesting question involved there, right? So one thing we might want to do is to look at the facts on the ground, right? So it is the case that metaphysical disagreement is vast, widespread. The vast, like, there are so many contradictory and variety of metaphysical beliefs that it's quite obviously the case that our metaphysical beliefs as humans are not reliable. So even though, even if it can be argued that uh, uh, general, a general reliability of our belief forming mechanism, uh, it is the case, it's an empirical fact. I don't know how you could argue. Oh, shoot. Just wrap it up real quick. Okay, sorry. So it is an empirical fact that uh, our, uh, our metaphysical belief forming mechanisms are unreliable. Now, if that's the case, uh, and theism is true, um, then that's a big problem because, again, theism, it matters with, what, with regard to what you do believe metaphysically. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this question is for Justin. And yeah. um, I'd like you to, if you can, just go a little bit deeper into how naturalism as a worldview can feed intangible concepts such as love and justice that have like zero physical evidence for existence or a scientific explanation and the fact yeah. that they cannot be actually measured. Yeah, 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 no, I, I agree, is the, so. Is, is the question how, how, sorry, I didn't really hear it. Yeah, maybe it would be better, yeah. I, I, can, I can ask again. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. So basically, like, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how naturalism as a worldview yeah. can, um, segue into values such as love and justice that are not actually by, so by segue, tangible. By segue, do you mean explain? Yeah, how can they fit into, yeah, basically. Okay, yep. sure. Okay, um, so I don't think of love as a physical thing. Um, it's a, it's not a, you can't, I, it's not a table, right? It's not like that. Um, rather, it's a process. It's a kind of relational property between two different uh, agents for example. Um, so yeah, I, those kinds of things are going to be like relational properties, how people are relating to each other. Words like love and things are going to, def are going to explain that kind of, it's a label for certain kinds of relational um, properties. Would you say the same thing for justice? He also mentioned justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So depending on what you exactly mean by justice, right, there are different views on this. Um, it's going to be the relationship between, say, a crime and the punishment, right, and the fittingness there. So thank you. Thank you. Eric, any, um, any thoughts on that? Briefly, I mean, I, I think it's a good question because I would argue that you're not going to get these immaterial properties popping by just rearranging physical matter. So this is why, like Willenberg, you have to say they're necessary. But then Willenberg also thinks that they're necessarily dependent on certain uh, conscious states, but then that's a contingent thing. So then he has a problem with how he makes something necessary based on something contingent. Um, and and I, I think it has other problems. And I'll just reiterate uh, that this is why I think it, it best fits on theism than naturalism or atheism. Justin, you claim yeah. that morality, if grounded in God, would be subjective, correct? I do, yes. Okay, so if theists claim that all reality is grounded in God, which means that if M grounded in G uh -huh. is subjective, then wouldn't all existence grounded in G still be subjective? And wouldn't that logically follow that there is no objective reality? That's an interesting claim. So, like, you're saying, do you think reality is grounded in the nature of God? I guess. Can you get back on the mic? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 
Sorry, sorry. I wasn't. I wasn't. That, that is clear. the theistic claim that all reality is grounded in the very nature and essence of God. Okay. So is that? Are you asking if I'm? If I think that's subjective? Don't go anywhere, Quincy. Stay sorry. Here. I'm trying to sit down. I got a bad back. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's what you get for yeah, booing sorry, me. Sorry, man. <laughs> Okay, so the theistic claim is that all reality is grounded in the nature of God. Okay. And that God is the grounding for all existence. Your claim is that morality, if grounded in God, is subjective. But then that would logically claim that according to the theistic worldview of the claim that, reality, or that morality is grounded in God, that all existence is subjective. And you would leave with zero objective existence. Okay. Unless we, can st unless we can agree that something grounded in God is objective. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're arguing for idealism or something. I don't know. Right? So, like, if, if it is the case that all reality is grounded in the sense of it's being constituted by the mind and nature of God, then there's some kind of idealism going on there. But what you're... But, I mean, unless you're an idealist, you're going to say that, like, this thing uh, exists independent of God's mind, even if you think it is causally grounded or, or based or what have you, right? Like, I think there's a, there's a distinction there that might be getting paved over. Before you come back on that, let's, let's try to keep the debate between... Oh. <laughs> well, that's why I was trying to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we could probably, you guys probably could have a debate yourselves. Uh, but Eric, any, any thoughts on... Uh, yeah, can you go back up there real quick? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just say that, that there needs to be an ultimate bedrock for any, for, there needs to be a foundation and grounding and an ultimate bedrock reality for, I would say, all things. There has to be a ground of something, and I think that is best explained by God and his nature. Um, we, we didn't go too deep into that, but if he holds to something like Willenberg's view, these things just exist as brute facts, and there's no explanation to them, which I would think le uh, loses points on simplicity and, and other stuff. So I think God is the best explanation, ultimately, and that it would be objective and necessary. All right, next question. Yeah, my, my question was for uh, Justin, but I like that both of you are answering. Uh, sure, yeah. I maybe didn't catch it. I was, uh, where, does, uh, where does conscience come from? Okay, uh, so my view on this um, uh, is, okay, so consciousness. Um, consciousness seems as though it can't be reduced to purely physical stuff, right? Would you agree with that? So if that's the case, um, and if we look at science and we look at physics and the kind of things that physics tell us, it's a, it's, they describe the world mathematically, okay? Uh, physics describes the relationships, the, the, um, the dispositions of fundamental uh, aspects of the universe, right? What they don't tell us is, is the intrinsic nature of these fundamental things, whatever they may be. Um, and me standing here thinking consciousness sure seems like a real thing, sure seems like it's irreducible, it can't be stuffed down into just physical, like billiard ball type causality. I'm going to say that there is another aspect that science, by the very tools of physics, can't get at. If that makes sense. Well, where does it come from, Justin? I think it's a, I think it's a fundamental aspect of reality. Um, whether or not it's a proto or micro phenomenal property, um, I, I don't know. It's, I'm within a small family of views that is something like that story. Uh, would you say you're like agnostic on the? Would you say that you're agnostic on the? Where does conscious come from? Or? Agnostic on. I mean, I guess, yeah, to some degree. Um, I think there's a lot that we don't know, right? So um, I'm going to admit my, hum you know, I'm going to be humble here. I don't, I don't really know. I'm, like I said, I'm kind of inferring from subjective things, how things appear to me. It looks as though consciousness can't be reduced. I think there's really good arguments for the idea that consciousness can't be reduced to pure physical billiard ball type behavior. Um, but it's also the fact that consciousness seems obvious. It seems like it's the thing that is the most undeniable to me. And if those, these, if those two things are things that I hold, what's the way to square them? I put consciousness as the base level of reality. All right, Eric. Um, so so I, I would have loved to talk about this more, but um, 
we agree that consciousness is at the base level of reality. I just think it's a God, and I don't think he has an explanation for it other than to avoid uh, uh, strict physicalism, which I think is most consistent. So that's why I, w I would even say he loses points on simplicity, explanatory power, and predictability. There is nothing in the base elements of the bottom physical level that would predict consciousness would exist. So the best option is to say, well, maybe it's just been there all along and didn't come out of the billiard balls. And I say yes and amen. And the best explanation for finite consciousness is an ultimate consciousness named God. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Question for Eric now. Uh, so you'd said that if God does not exist, there would be no teleology. So I'm curious then of like, what are about <clears throat> thoughts about natural teleology that say from thinkers like Aristotle, who was a theist, but he didn't think that teleology was sort of like imbued into objects, but rather it was sort of natural to them, similar to how like a compass will naturally tend towards north. Similar, there are, is, is gonna be a sort of built-in aspect of teleology to things that isn't actually like externally designed. So do you think that that's just like an inconsistent view or is it? Um, gosh, you said Aristotle, right? Was, it, was he the one that, that I think he, he talked about some kind of a force or something like that? that was, that was yeah, yeah, so for all things, there's going to be four causes, one of them being the final cause. So like an acorn like is a, naturally a to grow into a tree. Yeah, and, and, it's, and I'd have to brush up on my Aristotelian uh, stuff. But what, what I was trying to get at there was differentiating between a final cause and an efficient cause. A final cause is that for the reason... Uh, that for which something is brought about. So we've been talking about billiard balls. Maybe we should go play afterwards. If, um, <laughs> if you ask, why did this billiard ball move this way? The efficient cause is because this one hit this one. But if you ask, why did you hit it? Now you're asking teleologically, what's the goal? I'm trying to win the game. If there's no God, there is no goal. We're not evolving towards anything. We're just billiard balls hitting one another. And all you get is efficient causes, not a teleological final cause because there is none by default. Right, so the Aristotelian view. Oh, right. Where... Yeah, so I, I think... Again, having, not having brushed up recently on it, I would say that you're going to need to appeal to something for, their, for this teleology to exist in all things, uh, right. nature itself. So like all teleology would have to be like externally based, something putting it into something else. I don't know if I'd word it that way, but I, I'm okay with Okay. Yeah, yeah thank you. There, yeah. No comment. comment. No comment, okay. Uh, yeah, we've got time for maybe a couple more questions. We'll see how far we can get. Oh, okay, so this is a question for Eric. Um, for a God that is omnipotent, omniscient, and good, um, how is it possible for evil to exist at all? Because he made free creatures. That's one, one reason. And all I need would be one. If, if you're going to argue the logical, um, the logical problem of evil, it's had, having said to be solved by Alvin Plantinga, so atheists have now moved on to the evidential problem, and then that's... that's I think there's great answers there, and I think now the best place to go to, which Justin did, which one thing I want to compliment Justin on, I think, I think he knows his stuff, and he really did his homework, and he used some of the best arguments out there where you're now going to appeal to something like animal suffering, and I think that's the way to go for the atheist, um, and this is why I'm appreciative of guys like Trent Doherty, but if there's free will, I mean, that alone could explain that why there's any evil at all. Well, if I may ask one further question, is that all right? Yeah, sure, we have time. For an omnipotent God, um, omniscience kind of kind of is the same thing as foreordination. I, I disagree, but go ahead. Oh, then please explain. That would be my. That'd be my well, question. it's your claim, so you would have to tell me why you think that's the case. Oh, um, I mean, I'd be more interested in hearing from you about that. But it's your claim, not mine. <laughs> oh. This is a common well, accusation, and I don't. I just don't see how. That sorry. Works. Yeah. Let's let's get some uh, Justin's thoughts yeah, on, on that, um, and we'll move on. So it's certainly true that I think there is a um, a general belief that the logical problem of evil has been uh, kind of swept and swept away by planning a and out from its uh, from its absence grows the evidential problem. Um, I don't think that that's true. I think that's a false narrative. Um, I think that there are uh, I think that there are some significant problems with uh, planning as free will defense. Uh, that said, uh, there are other uh, forms of the logical problem of evil uh, that planning as argument doesn't interact with. Um, there's a number of them. There's uh, like 
Uh, Michael Tooley presents one. Um, <coughs> one that I like a lot is uh, one by J. L. Schellenberg uh, puts out a, a logical problem of evil. I think that the logical problem of evil is quite alive and well. Um, it just gets extremely technical and it, it can be hard to defend in a, because, because it's so technical, it can be hard to defend in a context like this. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, I think, uh, well, we'll see. Maybe one or two more. Excuse me, I'm not putting in. Although we do need a white ladies, um, a young, old white ladies demographic here, so I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I hope this is good. Uh, I'll leave it to the moderator to decide who this goes to. Um, first, at least, who, assuming we all want to know the truth and that the proposition about the existence of an object is somewhat mundane, why is it so hard to find agreement on the, the question of whether or not a god exists? Is it worldview? Is it methodology? What is it? Who, Great who question. Is your question uh, it's for you. <laughs> no, I don't yeah, know. you get to decide. Oh, thing. sorry, yeah. I didn't hear that <laughs> part. To answer, but oh, um, well, let, let's give each, each of you two minutes. That's my sure. Decision. So the question was, why is the question so dang hard, right? Why can't we find agreement on the yeah, yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. What, what does it come down to? Yeah, I, it comes down to a lot of things, right? So I think a lot of people are going to interpret evidence in particular ways. Um, I don't, um, well, I guess the simple answer is that people bring to arguments pre- they have a predisposition in the way in which they're going to interpret data, okay? Um, they have a predisposition as to what kind of general intuitions they have, um, their general moral intuitions. There's a, there's a difference in, 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 and I think a lot of these arguments, when you get down to the kind of brass tacks of things, a lot of the time, it does kind of bear in large part on like what you find plausible given your prior beliefs. And that's why uh, I take um, a, uh, a stance um, by, kind of named by William Rowe of friendly atheism in the sense that I, while I think that atheism is true, I don't think it's at all irrational to say that God exists. Um, I think that there are compelling reasons to think that God exists. Uh, I think that there are good arguments on both sides. Um, and so, really, at the end of the day, it's just because there's a lot of stuff at play, and it's a hard question. You're weighing a lot of different things, and it's not always exactly clear how the best way to do it is in the way that tracks to the correct conclusion. So, um, yeah, I think that we're all reasonable, so long as we're being reasonable in how we're approaching the question. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a lot of factors. Um, one thing, there's a lot of things we didn't even get to touch on, but, you know, like his divine hiddenness, I, I think, um, and, and if, hopefully it's not a mischaracterization, if it is, well, then it, it wouldn't apply to him, but I, I, I don't think it's the case. I think we're, I don't think it's the case that if you give, give a person enough or the sufficient information or, or evidence or arguments that they would necessarily believe. We know a lot of people who have good reasons to believe things and refuse to, so there's some pride or some, I don't know, personal agendas. There's a lot of number of other things. One thing I find interesting, though, is like you have someone like Thomas Nagel who admits and says something like, it's not just that I don't believe God, I don't want him to exist. That, that's called the, thank you for that, that's called something like the, uh, uh, what, what, what's the word? Uh, cosmic authority problem. So I, I think it comes down to a number of things. All right, let's do one more. Oh, actually, since, we, we, since you've already asked the question, I know that John Buck um, already asked another question. Smile but, faded from his um, face. I, we'll let the let, yeah, we'll, we'll let someone else have a chance. And then this, do what? Do, do what? We're to go together. Just both talk at the same time. Last question. Get this will fight. be the last question. Uh, yeah, you guys la went back and forth about the philosophy behind the fall. Okay, so last two you said? Okay, okay, I'm getting the override from my wife. Right. All right. <laughs> last two. So you went back and forth a little bit about the fall, but I'm curious, Justin, yeah. you talked about animal suffering, violence, privation. Do you think those things are evil? And then the, how do you account for evil or suffering in the world? Yeah, yeah. So I think that suffering is intrinsically bad. Okay. Um, we agree about that. As for evil, um, I don't think it's evil in the sense that I don't think, um, well, I should say 
it's evil in the sense that like that state of affairs of suffering is bad, right? But I don't. What I'm not going to say is that like the riot, the lion has done something wrong when it takes down the gazelle, right? I think that the moral kind of those moral assessments are going to uh, supervene on like the capacities of a given creature, the acting agent, right? So insofar as a creature does not have the ability to consider their uh, actions and insofar as their action um, is reasons responsive, uh, or rather that the action flows from a reasons responsiveness uh, within the creature, um, if certain kinds of conditions are met, it makes sense to hold someone as responsible. Um, whereas, uh, you know, like a lion who doesn't have those kind of higher order capacities, uh, it would not make sense to uh, place blame on such a, a creature. So hopefully that... I guess I'm just asking because you talked about how that suffering was evidence that maybe theism didn't make sense. So I was curious where you... Right, right. So because suffering is an intrinsically bad state of affairs, right? Um, and because God, if it exists, cares deeply about not having creatures suffer, right? Uh, then there's got to be some kind of explanation. There, there needs to be some kind of account as to how that works. Um, and so people have given various accounts of that. I don't find them plausible, but that's the kind of general idea, right? Like, God loves his creatures, creatures suffer, what's the deal, right? All right, Eric. Yeah, um, I mean, I think if there's free will, I think uh, it, also if there's an afterlife, yes, God doesn't want his creatures to suffer, and if the ultimate suffering is going to come in the afterlife, well, then maybe suffering here can teach us something that will keep us from that place. So I, I think there's lots of reasons God would allow this. I think it's, it's predictable. Um, he mentioned something about holding people morally responsible, but, you know, if I were to go back to my argument about free will, if you're causally determined to do something, why would we hold that person responsible if they weren't the cause of their own actions? Um, but, yeah, I, I would go back to, I, I don't think evil would exist. I think you would just have, I don't prefer this. And there has to be some kind of a standard. And, and without going back to there, I just point back to my argument. I think God's the best explanation for any of these things, including evil and suffering. All right, last question. Yes. Um, so my question is for Justin first. Um, yeah. Let's say Eric is correct. Christianity is, you know, the way, the truth. And you end up going to um, eternal suffering. Do you believe that God's going to give you a second chance there? you know, after life, and for Eric, um, do you believe biblically, according to what the Bible says, that he's gonna have a second chance or not? So, so the question was, uh, assuming I am wrong and Christianity is true, a, specifically a Christianity that entails a um, <coughs> eternal conscious torment version of the afterlife for people who happen to not believe the correct propositions when they die, um, the question is, do I think I would have a second chance at that point? Yeah. Let's say you're in eternal suffering. Do you believe yeah. if you repent there that God's going to give you a second chance to enter heaven? I think if he were good, he would. Um, but uh, because a, a good God... Here's the thing. I think that Christianity is incompatible, or I think that that particular version of Christianity, I should say, um, is incompatible with perfect love. Um, I think there are a number of good reasons for this. I think that the most compelling arguments for this claim come from Christian philosophers um, who argue that divine perfect love does not lose out. It will, in the end, save everyone. Um, and I think that's a, that's a beautiful picture. And so under, your, um, under the, 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 the contingencies that you gave me in, in your initial argument, then I don't know. I'm not a theologian. I would, you, know, you would have to ask that particular view, right? Like, I don't, I'm not... It doesn't make sense for me to answer that argument. But, again, if I find myself in hell after I die, insofar as I then believe in a perfect God, I'm going to think that, I'm eventually, that God is eventually going to find his lost sheep. Um, yeah, it's a heavy question. Um, but to, to just answer it bluntly, I, I know I don't think he'd have another chance, um, which is why I hope he does it on this side of heaven. Um, 
And, and I mean, universe, universalism, that could be a possibility. I personally reject it. But one thing we didn't even touch on is something like Molinism. If God is not just omniscient but knows counterfactuals, he knows what it takes and whether a person would or would not receive and accept divine revelation. So it w I would be under the... Uh, I would hold to the view that by the time a person dies and is in the afterlife already, God has exhausted uh, uh, what he could do and just giving them more revelation would only add to their punishment in the afterlife. So I, I and as C.S. Lewis said, hell's gates are locked from the inside. It could be the case that people even in the afterlife would still reject him. Uh, imagine there was a guy who, who was interested in you and he was a stalker. And then imagine that for the rest of eternity, now you have to be with this person, so to speak, uh, because he kidnapped you or something like that. Uh, I think C.S. Lewis said something like, God loves people enough to give them what they want at the end of the day, even if it's total separation from him, and what could be more fair than that? Okay. All right, that's yeah. time. <laughs> okay, so the evening is almost done. I know that we're, we are over time, and uh, some people have, have had to leave, which is totally fine. But what we're going to do is uh, five-minute closings from each debater, and then we'll, we'll finish out. So, uh, Eric, go ahead. And oh, I'm go for that. Yep. Take I, the podium one last when time. When I go up there, say time, because I'm just going to read until you tell me to stop. All right. So, gotcha. I don't have anything to I do. probably won't um, take up five minutes, because I have to go to the bathroom soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's too much left to be said, but I do want to give a few shout outs to some people, um, uh, people that, that helped me uh, prepare leading up. Um, Adam Johnson, uh, and I mentioned his book, Divine Love Theory, uh, Dan Christophilus of Exploring Reality, uh, Tim Stratton, Luke Barnes, Alan Hainline, and Andrew Moon. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I mean, we, we, we look at evidence, what is most reasonable, what best fits, what's the best explanation, and I think what we heard today was that theism has better predictability, better explanations, better theodicy, over naturalism. I, I, anything that he brought up, it didn't seem as if it had any superiority to theism. Um, and as I mentioned, for, for his side, quote unquote, to win, he would have to at least show that theism doesn't at least equally predict it, and to show that naturalism has a better explanation and prediction of these things, but even something as simple as being conscious. Something as simple as the fact of these moral values existing, I think, are real problems for his view. And this is why I quoted some naturalists in the beginning, like uh, Paul Churchland, who says, there is no need nor room to fit anything non-physical into our account of ourselves or anything else. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm going to keep praying for Justin. I would love to see him in heaven, honestly. You know, he's a great guy. <clears throat> so yeah, let's, let's pray for Justin. But nevertheless, I, I, I appreciate his time. I appreciate you guys coming. And uh, God bless. Yeah, just time me because I don't have a... I got you. Thing. Thank you. Just turn off your mic. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank Eric. Um, I know there's the, that's coming from a good place. He's saying he wants to pray for me. I appreciate that. I don't obviously think that it does anything, but I can appreciate... The, uh, the other orientedness of that kind of sentiment. Uh, I want to first um, thank both Eric and Capturing Christianity for hosting this event. This is a fantastic thing to do. Um, I'm going to respond to uh, some of uh, Eric's criticisms here. Um, a number of times throughout this evening, uh, we uh, were told about uh, Molinism and uh, Eric is Eric's endorsement of libertarian free will, right? So, um, however, philosophers Nevin Kleimenhaga and Daniel Rubio have recently and persuasively argued that Molinism is actually incompatible with libertarianism, with libertarian free will, because if Molinism is true, it entails the existence of a collection of facts which fully and completely explain both an agent's choice to choose A over B and all other acts that the agent does that influence the agent's choice to choose A over B. Insisting on God's weak actualization uh, does not change the fact that however weak it in fact is, it is a part of that full, complete, and infallibly foreknown explanation of that agent's choice. 
Returning to the fall theodicy, Eric's first response here is to, you know, uh, posit the fall as the explanation for animal suffering. Uh, if we're talking about a causal explanation, it would seem that Eric would need to give um, at least a bit more detail as to uh, explain how this does anything to explain all the animal suffering that predates the existence of modern humans. Um, if, uh, however, we are referring to um, a more literal interpretation of the book of Genesis where um, animal suffering does not predate uh, animal, uh, does not predate uh, human sin, um, then the problem, of course, is not about animal suffering, but the problem, of course, is our ability for our view to actually cohere with the um, findings of modern science. Um, if he can do that, however, um, how, then he needs to answer how probable the fall is on bare theism. Um, it does not appear that this is at all um, going to be expected on bare theism. Uh, how probable the, he also needs to answer how probable the specific data of animal predation, parasitism, and privation on the conjunction of bare theism and the fall. Um, predation, parasitism, and privation are evidently not just accidental byproducts, but, uh, you know, or the result of some catastrophic failure. Rather, these evils are intrinsic to the natural system. The body plans of many animals are, are built for, apparently, the tearing into uh, the flesh of others. Um, to use a favorite term of Eric's, this evil seems teleological. But if the fall doesn't predict the data, then all it does is further complicate Eric's theory. This gives us nothing by way of explanatory power. In positing the fall, Eric shows us that his project is far more theological than philosophical. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't have anything against theology. I just think uh, his project should respect its mother. Um, the more interesting response that Eric offers is soul building. And here he draws on the work of philosopher Trent Doherty, who explains evil, or who explains animal suffering by way of the earth's purpose being for the exercise and development of virtue. God then does right by his creatures in the afterlife, wherein animals, through a process of deification, become persons capable of retroactively consenting to their suffering. The evil in their suffering is thereby defeated. However, a new advanced theodicy that builds on a prior theodicy often inherits the liabilities of the latter. Soul building theodicy relies on the assumption that virtues that have been earned through free decisions are more intrinsically valuable than unearned ready-made virtues. However, Hick himself, the, uh, the original author of the uh, soul building theodicy recognizes that this principle cannot be compellingly argued for. He writes, quote, the principle expresses a basic value judgment, which cannot be established by argument, but which one can only present in the hope that it will be as morally plausible and indeed compelling to others as to oneself. However, I think when examined, we are left with no good reason for accepting Hick's principle uh, or any theodicy based upon it. First, it implies that God's perfectly moral character would have been better had it been earned through good moral choices uh, rather than essentially uh, ready-made perfect nature that he in fact has. Secondly, it appears that many of the virtues are valuable only in a context where suffering is commonplace. Come on. Thank you very much. You've all been lovely, a patient audience. Um, take my argument seriously. Take Eric's argument seriously. Thank you again. Well, that concludes the evening. Thank you all for coming out. Um, that was so sweet. So, I was asked to remind you that uh, it is nighttime and these walkways are uneven. Please be careful as you're walking back to your car. Tread softly. But thank you for, thank you for coming out. It's been a great, it's been a great time. <laughs> go, go, go.